the surface, Asatomari's 2013 film By Location is a story about doppelgangers and the threat of stolen identity. Shinobu, our protagonist, is an aspiring artist that has withdrawn from the social world to focus on creating a masterpiece that she hopes will be her breakout work in the art world. This focus is interrupted one day by the chime of her doorbell. Answering its call, she meets her new downstairs neighbor Masaru, and, as she puts it, the encounter changed her life. Shinobu and Masaru fall in love, get married, and move into his apartment. In order to juggle her new domestic responsibilities and still pursue her artistic aspirations, Shinobu keeps the upstairs apartment as her studio, hoping to finish the work that may launch her career. Soon after marriage, however, Shinobu discovers that she has a doppelganger in her neighborhood, what the film calls a bilocation. Joining a secret group of others with bilocations, Shinobu uncovers a truth that shakes her to the very core. In his work on doppelgangers in Japanese horror cinema, Professor Stephen Brown traces the historical lineage of doubles in film and literature, both in Japan and elsewhere. Likewise, in its opening scene, Asato's film itself cites the biblical origin story of Cain and Abel as twin doubles, positioning the film in a framework of transnational discourse. However, as Professor Brown points out in his work, Asato's film reworks the tale of male rivalry as a story of female rivalry and, in his words, a woman's struggle with her own self-image come to life. In this video, I asked Professor Brown to speak more about his interpretations of Asato's film, with the theme of doubles and doubling reveals about contemporary social anxieties, and for his insights into the medium of Japanese horror cinema. Hello, I'm Colleen Laird. It is my great pleasure to speak with Professor Stephen Brown, a scholar of Japanese film, transnational cinema, and sound studies in the Department of Comparative Literature at the University of Oregon. Today we'll be discussing Asatomari's 2012 film By Location, which Professor Brown discusses at length in his most recent book in a chapter in entitled Double Trouble, Doppelgangers in Japanese Horror. Stephen, it is a delight to see you and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Colleen. It's, it's great to uh, discuss one of my favorite J-horror films of all time with you. Thank you so much. I also really love this film and I think we're going to get to that um, in a moment. Now, since I've known you for a while, I think it's safe for me to say that you have a passion for Japanese cinema and Japanese horror film. So I'd like to start out with a bit of a multifaceted question, I guess, uh, to get into Asato Mari's film. And that is, what inspired you to write uh, about by location in particular? And how do films like by location fit into the larger scope of contemporary Japanese horror as a genre and historical trend? Uh, well, one of the things I think that really intrigued me, uh, I'll just start off uh, by saying this, is that one of the things that intrigued me most of all, I think, about By Location is the fact that both the movie and the novel upon which it's based were the creative products of women. Uh, by Location, uh, as, as you noted, was directed by Asato Mari. Uh, it was released in 2013, but it's an adaptation of a novel of the same name by Hojo Haruka uh, that was published in 20, 2010. And, and received first prize for the best Japanese horror novel of the year. And as I'm sure uh, you're well aware, uh, since you, you do, you've done extensive work on, on women directors, there was a recent study of the film industry that showed that between 1998 and 2019, the percentage of women directors around the, wor around the world only rose from 9% to 13%. But what I find interesting as a, as a sort of horror specialist is that Generally speaking, it's my impression that horror movies are one sector of the film industry that's seen a steady uptick in opportunities for female directors that are sadly lacking in other genres. In addition to the director of By Location, I'm thinking of directors such as Australian uh, Jennifer Kent, who directed The Babadook, that uh, came out in 2014, a really phenomenal film. Uh, other films uh, such as A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, uh, by Iranian-American director Anna Lily Amanpour, also came out in 2014, as well as um, uh, Mexican director Isa Lopez, who directed Tigers Are Not Afraid, that, that was released in 2017. Sofia Takal, she's an, uh, an American director who, who did Always Shine uh, in 2016. And to this list, one could also add 
uh, French director Yulia Ducournau, who directed Raw in 2016, Belgian director Axel Carolyn and her film Soulmate in 2013, not to mention directors such as Sam Cassavetes, who did Kiss of the Damned, Lee Yaniak, who did Honeymoon, and more recently, I don't know if you've seen uh, uh, these films, but uh, Australian director Natalie Erica James mm. uh, directed a film titled Relic, uh, that, just, that came out in 2020, along with um, uh, Romola Garay, uh, she's an mm -hmm. English director who did uh, Amulet, and all of these directors uh, uh, belong to this list of really standout female directors of contemporary horror. And this group of directors, along with you know, many others that I, that I haven't mentioned, have created what I regard as some of the most innovative horror films in recent memory, uh, which have really contributed immensely to what, what one might describe as a sort of renaissance in horror cinema that we're currently ex enjoying. And I view Asato Mari uh, as being part of this, this current mm. movement of global horror cinema featuring women directors. And I think Bilocation is, is certainly uh, an outstanding example of this trend. But it should be pointed out that unlike most of the films that I, that I just mentioned, which are largely independent horror films produced outside of the studio system, Bilocation is a studio film. It, mm. it was produced by Karokawa, one of, the, one of Japan's big four film studios along with Toho, Toei, and Shochiku. And as you probably know, Kadokawa has a, a long history of producing J-horror films, including such standouts as One Missed Call, Chakushin mm -hmm. and Itakashi film, which I, I'm trying to recall. I, are you including that in your, in your course when you teach it? No, I'm not. <laughs> Whatever, it does, it's all right. There, there's no, <laughs> but then uh, under the Kadokawa, um, the, production uh, uh, framework. There are also films such as the, the recent Sarako versus Kayako, mm. Mashup, um, a number of films from the Tomie series mm. uh, that, that, that are adaptations of Ito Junji's famous manga of the same name, as well as other, uh, as well as a, a number of other titles included in the, in the Karokawa horror collection films like Inugami, Shikoku and others. Mm -hmm. In terms of how bilocation fits into the genre of J-horror more, more generally, I tend to view it as a, as a sort of a hybrid form that draws inspiration from both non-Japanese mm -hmm. cinema and Japanese cinema. It, it certainly draws inspiration from non-Japanese doppelganger films, such as, for example, uh, the George Romero-directed um, Stephen King adaptation, The Dark Half. Mm -hmm. But... It also, I think, draws some inspiration from some of the J-horror classics, you know, Jewel, mm. Dark Water, uh, again, One Missed Call. And, and, and some of those films, a number of those films include the motif of vengeful ghosts who impersonate a potential victim's family member or friend mm. in order to beguile that person into some sort of encount, dangerous encounter. Mm. My location really takes this motif and develops it into a full-blown doppelganger narrative and pushes the envelope of such narratives by multiplying the number of doppelgangers and foregrounding mm. the politics involved. Um, as I think I may have mentioned to you, I'll, I'll, I'm preparing to teach a seminar on doppelganger cinema mm. in Detroit. And the vast majority of films that, that we'll be discussing are typically about a protagonist who discovers that he or she has a doppelganger. And it's usually one doppelganger, and, mm. rather than a plethora of doppelgangers. <laughs> That's really, I think, one of the things that distinguishes bilocation is just the sheer number of doppelgangers, as well as the foregrounding of, of, of the gender politics. And then, of course, it, it, it also manages to, to infuse the narrative with this heavy dose of melodrama. Mm -hmm. It's entirely in keeping. I don't think it's a, that, that's at all uh, strange for any of us who are familiar with J-horror. It's entirely in keeping with what might be described as the genre hybridity that mm -hmm. went off in, in J-horror films in which traditional social structures of one sort or another come under attack. 
Yeah, a lot of the things that you just touched on, even in the introduction, are, are things, in fact, that I want to ask you about uh, later, not the least of which are the role of gender politics from a, a woman director um, in this field that you're right, is seeing um, a proliferation of women directing specifically in horror, which I think is um, interesting in and of itself. And also the plethora of doppelgangers, a lot of mirroring that happens, layers and layers of mirroring, and also melodrama that happens at the end of this film, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, before we get to that, thank you for that good introduction of, of why we need to consider this film uh, or why you considered this film. Can you pinpoint some favorite scenes that you found to be sort of rather compelling that um, put this film in the forefront of your mind? There are three scenes, three scenes in particular that, that mm. come to mind that I just wanted to talk about briefly um, and I think really help um, uh, encapsulate the, the, uh, the brilliance of, of, of my location. Uh, the first scene occurs right after the prologue. Mm. Uh, we see Shinobu in her apartment studio and, and it, it, she's, she's hard at work as an artist. She's drawing a scene that mirrors the view outside her apartment. And mm -hmm. it even includes in her charcoal drawing the sliding glass door that inframes her view. And as it turns out, we learn that both Shinobu and her bilocation are artists. Uh, and although the scenes of them creating art aren't scary in the mm -hmm. least, mm -hmm. I find them extremely compelling as, as character development sequences. Mm -hmm. uh, they show how much the creation of art means to both Shinobu and, and her doppelganger. I also find this scene interesting for the ways in which it evokes similar paintings uh, by the surrealist René Magritte mm -hmm. uh, that, that blur the boundaries between what might be called depicted space and real space, or between the virtual and the actual. <clears throat> Here I'm thinking of paintings such as The, the Human Condition mm -hmm. and others, <clears throat> in which Magritte attempts to, I think, destabilize our sort of knee-jerk reliance on realism mm -hmm. or discourses of realism, which uh, position images as more or less faithful representations or duplications of reality. And in sharp contrast, Magritte's brand of surrealism suggests that no matter how faithfully an object seems to be represented, we're never able to really capture the material thing itself. Mm -hmm. And so Shinobu's picture within a picture within uh, the film, although it doesn't necessarily blur the boundaries between the, the virtual and the actual to the same degree as Magritte, but by invoking Magritte, by location, I think it effectively intimates that it too, as a film, is engaging similar issues mm. involving this liminal space between interior and exterior, between depicted space and real space, virtual and actual. And of course, this blurring between virtual and actual is also really very much at the heart of mm. the film's complex dynamics between self and double. Mm -hmm. Because the double, of course, is, is a virtual self. Mm -hmm. The second scene uh, that, I, that I, I'm really very fond of is when uh, Takamura Shinobu comes to the realization for the first time, really quite late in the film, mm. that she herself is in fact a bilocation. All this time, mm. he thought she actually existed. She thought she was a, 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 a human being like any other human being. Mm -hmm. the, the, who was the other Shinobu. Kirimura Shinobu, who was the bilocation. And it's, it's a very powerful scene. I love, we get this POV shot uh, in this slide as she looks down at her hand and it starts to dissolve. Mm. And it's followed by a close up of her face. Mm. As her, her head begins to dissolve and you see the reaction on her face. It's this, it's this moment, it's, we get this aff affection image as Deleuze mm. called. And I just find this moment of epiphany so powerful mm. uh, within the film. And then one more scene, I, there's a, one more scene mm -hmm. I want to mention that we'll continue on. The third scene that, I, that I, I find really interesting is the way in which Asato Mari handles uh, the suicide of Kirimura Shinobu. Mm -hmm. And in this frame, it's really hard to capture this particular frame because it, this, what occurs in this frame happens so quickly. But mm. it, in this frame, you can just make out the blur mm. of, of um, Kirimura Shinobu falling outside the apartment balcony as her bio-location mm -hmm. in the foreground, foreground, who's Takamura Shinobu, seems to sense what is happening, but doesn't actually see, uh, see the, the suicide taking place. But if you blink, you miss it. 
It's just a blur. Mm -hmm. uh, and just before this scene uh, takes place, Shinobu and her, her bilocation, they meet face to face. Mm -hmm. and her bilocation offers to sacrifice herself if Shinobu will agree to assume her place in her marriage with Masaru. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is not at all what the original Shinobu had in mind. And mm -hmm. she decides to end her own life instead, which she does by jumping off the balcony. Uh, mm -hmm. And as soon as it occurs, the bilocation dematerializes. And it's mm -hmm. uncertain if her last words expressing her love for Masato are even heard by him. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is, this is tragic melodrama to the extreme. And the headlines <laughs> are, are quite striking. Mm -hmm. But I find it incredibly moving every time I watch this particular scene. And I think mm -hmm. it's very deftly, deftly handled. I love that you picked those three scenes because they're so intimately connected to, I mean, of course the film as a whole is, is its own thing, but these, I feel you, you got to the, the core of the film. So I'm having a bit of an emotional response to that last scene, but um, the last scene is also mirroring the first scene that you showed us where it's the, the view out the window. Um, and that view out the window will of course become important for both versions um, of Shinobu in their artwork, as you say, the artwork is so important to them, but to end with another view out a window um, that's so tragic is, um, I found to be quite moving. <laughs> I mean, that's melodrama and quite profound, but there's an, an echo between those two things, especially with the relationship to, I think the blurring between that, which is, which is virtual and, and that which is real. Of course, in the last scene, we have the real destroying themselves in the virtual um, lingering on for a few, moments and in your your book you also connect this blurring of the virtual and the real of course to the legacy of film theory and realism in film theory taking us from adorno to deleuze in the book as well so these all um echo with one another um thank you um for that so yeah, we've gotten quite into the film at this point but i want to draw back for just a second and ask you a foundational question um which is the very first scene of the the film and you do talk about this in your, your book chapter, but I think um, without your book chapter, it's just a, a question mark for everyone who watches this film, unless they know Russian, um, which is the beginning of this film, it has a scene in Russian, and I don't think there's subtitles for that, either in the export with English subtitles, and I don't think in the Japanese original they provide Japanese subtitles for it. So um, can you break down the scene for us that happens entirely in a language that most audiences that this was made for wouldn't have access to? Adam позвал Еву, жену свою, и она зачала и родила Каина, и сказала, приобрела я человека от Господа, и еще родила брата его, Авеля, и был Авель пастырь овец. А Каин был земледелец. Спустя несколько времени Каин принес от плодов земли дар Господу, и Авель также принес от первородного стада и от стука их. И презрел Господь на Авеля и на дар его, а на Каина и на дар не презрел. Каин сильно огорчился. И поникло лицо его, и был Авель пастырь овец. Если делаешь доброе, то не поднимаешь лица. лица. А если не делаешь доброго, то у дверей грех лежит. Он влечет тебя к себе, но ты господствуй над ним. И сказал Кайнавелю, и сказал Кайнавелю, и сказал Кайнавелю, и сказал Кайнавелю. Here's a frame grab from, from that, that prologue. 
and it is certainly one of the strangest scenes I think ever to appear at the outset of a J horror film. Hmm. Um, it, it, although one's first reaction may be that it's taking place in a Russian Orthodox church, it's an act, not actually a Ru Russian Orthodox church, technically, technically speaking, since in the Russian Orthodox church, they don't permit lay readers to recite the Bible or parishioners to sit. Hmm. But it is a Russian Christian church and it's located somewhere in Europe. Uh, hmm. And that's the only, uh, the only thing that's indicated in the, in the, in the subtitles to the, the Japanese uh, Blu-ray is that it's, it's somewhere in Europe. It's, it's hmm. a church somewhere, in, a Russian church somewhere in Europe. Um, and the scene involves, as you, as you mentioned, these untranslated uh, passages. There, hmm. and what's, being, what's, un, what's left untranslated are excerpts from the story of Cain and Abel from mm -hmm. the book of Genesis. Uh, and these excerpts are being read aloud by a Russian woman and her doppelganger, her by location mm -hmm. appears. Um, but there's really, you know, what's quite intriguing is that there's really no comparable scene in Hojo Haruka's by location novel. Nothing like that occurs in the prologue to her novel. Hmm. Really begs the question as to what it's doing in, the, in this uh, J-horror movie. And one of the things I, I try to, to suggest in my chapter on by location is that if you're able to figure out, if you're able to, to consult someone who speaks Russian, as, as <laughs> I, I did, I, my, as you know, my, 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 my wife is a Russian specialist. And mm. so I, I implored her to help me <laughs> translate what, what, they were, what they were talking about. Yes. Or, or if you have the opportunity to read a, a scholarly analysis of, of the scene, such as in my mm. book, mm. it's hard to know what's going on. Mm. What is taking place is uh, excerpts from the story of Cain and Abel are being read aloud. And then the bilocation starts to repeat those same excerpts. And it, what is being read aloud in relation to Cain and Abel resonates with the doppelganger narrative and bilocation, mm -hmm. offering a, a story of rivalry, mm. jealousy, displacement, and murder that really foreshadows how some of the characters in bilocation feel about their doubles and how some of the doubles feel about their originals. Mm. Almost every doppelganger narrative ever created, almost every one that I've ever come across involves on some level what one might describe as a crisis of differentiation mm. in which the original tries to distinguish itself from the, dub from the double lest it be supplanted by the double. So rivalry and, rivalry and, and, and fears of displacement mm -hmm. are sort of built in to, to the doppelganger narrative. But you have to ask yourself, what it sort of begs the question, what dramatic purpose is served mm. by leaving this important prologue about, about Cain and Abel completely mm -hmm. untranslated? It's untranslated. Mm -hmm. I, I rely upon the, the um, Japanese Blu-ray uh, mm -hmm. version, and, it's, and it's, it's completely untranslated. It just says in, in brackets, I think, spoken Russian. <laughs> it, gives, it, gives a, it gives a the location somewhere in Europe, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, of course, it, it might have been more helpful if they had translated the, the, the prologue, but I think it actually piques one's curiosity about what's being mm -hmm. said and how it relates to the film as a whole. And it sort of teases one mm -hmm. to the viewer with what you don't understand. Um, and I don't know if the, the, the intent was to encourage people to do some internet research to figure out <laughs> what is said in the, the prologue or... Mm -hmm you know, if it encourages people to, uh, to consult their Russian friends to, to help decipher it for them. But it is actually an integral part of the, of the film. It's not a throwaway scene. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad I could help explain it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's wonderful. It's so intriguing because I think, I think I forget about that scene because there's no reference to it later in the film. It's, it's a very unusual choice just to have something that completely, it, it does sow some seeds, I think, which we'll probably get to later about what might be important in the film, but it is such a, a bizarre choice. Um, and because the language is not accessible to the intended audience, I think it encourages viewers 
perhaps, I don't know, it's just occurring to me now to rely on visuals instead, right? Sort of there's ominous sounds that are happening that makes it scary and it's in a strange and unknown setting that's unfamiliar. Um, and so you're just relying on the visual clues that happen. So it's the, the doppelganger who shows up and setting the precedent for the IQ that will become a motif throughout the film. And then um, I think paper mysteriously uh, blows in the wind or something. So you know something's kind of off there. Um, but it sort of tricks, I think, the viewer into relying on visuals, which in my opinion, the film then totally subverts. That you, you can't rely on that at all. So maybe there's, um, there's also a, a trick that's being set up by her at the, the very beginning. Um, yeah, I think, I, think that's, I think that's what you're <laughs> um, So again, this is sort of about the wrapping of the film, but it takes us deeply into some of these ideas. The poster image, as you talk about in your book, and anybody who's looking for the film will see the poster image first or the DVD cover. It features this image of the conjoined um, doll, and I think you're bringing it up here. Yeah, it's an odd, this conjoined doll image, um, and I had some trouble deciphering this image throughout the film because their, their knees, I think, might be ball joints, so it's like this classic sort of knobby doll, but then I, was, I wasn't I was sure that was their knees. It's a very confusing image, um, but one doll has a green eye and one doll has a red eye, and that visual motif, that color coding is, of course, very important in the film. Um, but we don't have conjoined twins, but we have this visual image of a, a conjoined doll. So what are we to make of this connection between dolls and the doppelganger? I guess I would start by pointing out um, something that, that I don't talk about in, in my book. Uh, mm. I just didn't have space to do it, but it, it, I, it's, a, it's a connection that I, I was aware of uh, while I was writing the chapter, and that is uh, a connection to the work of German surrealist Hans Bellmer. Mm. Mm -hmm. And although I, I don't discuss this connection in my, in my chapter on bilocation, I, I do talk a little bit about Bellmer in a subsequent chapter on surrealist horror in relation to um, Miike Takashi's outlandish Yakuza body horror film, Gozu. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as you as you're probably aware, Belmer is famous for creating this really grotesque series of ball jointed dolls. He's really known mm -hmm. for his ball jointed dolls that have typically been read by scholars as an artistic tool of social critique against uh, some of the racist stereotypes that were being promulgated by Nazi ideologues while Belmer was living in, in Germany and, and working as an artist. Mm -hmm. And by photographing his dolls in a way that really underscores their grotesque and 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 uncanny aspects, mm -hmm. um, Elmer intended them as, as acts of resistance against the the Nazi regime at the time and its its cult of the perfect body. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think the political connotations of Belmer's ball jointed dolls necessarily enter into Bilocation's citation of Belmer. It's it's sort it's a very sort of um, subtle citation. Mm -hmm. I do think that conjoinment is relevant to the continuum of doubling that appears in bilocation. Mm. As, as you said, we never encounter conjoined twins per se. There are no mm -hmm. characters in bilocation that are conjoined twins. Uh, and, and it should also be said that conjoined twins are not simply equivalent to the figure of the doppelganger. Mm. But the specter of conjoinment suggests the challenges, I think, that are faced by characters such as Shinobu and her bilocation, who aren't bio biologically conjoined, but mm -hmm. end up in a, in a way being as, as it were, existentially conjoined, mm -hmm. uh, due to any ways in which their parallel lives are sort of inextricably bound together. And so um, when I, when I um, teach my seminar on, on doppelganger, doppelganger cinema, mm. I look at doubling, I don't focus just on doppelgangers, but I look at a, a, a wide variety of different forms of doubling. Uh, I talk about a continuum of doubling and you have a, you know, the, the traditional doppelganger on one end, but you also have other forms of doubling that includes twins. So in some mm -hmm. cases, it might be conjoined twins, it might simply be identical twins who are not conjoined. Mm -hmm. uh, then there are also you know, clones. Clones also may be situated on this continuum of doubling. Mm -hmm. um, characters who uh, uh, reside in parallel universes. You know, there mm -hmm. are science fiction films that deal with parallel universes 
and characters who cross over uh, and meet their other self. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also different ways in which doubling can be expressed. Uh, and I, I do think it's interesting that although conjoinment does not become a biological motif in mm -hmm. bilocation, I, th I, th I think that by uh, using these Belmaresque ball jointed dolls, not only in the poster, but also as, as you see in this um, frame grab, which is mm -hmm. a hallway leading to the two, the two support group rooms. And mm -hmm. as, as, your, as your students will recall, or they'll discover, I suppose, once they see the film, <laughs> the, when you enter into this, there's this space that's uh, set up that's bifurcated. Mm. And you pass through a mirror room, and then you're told which room to enter. Mm -hmm. And one room that's the green room, I think that's the room on the left, if I recall correctly, and mm -hmm. then the red room is the room on the right. Mm -hmm. Both are described as bilocation support groups, but one room, I think it's the red room, if I call, recall correctly, is mm -hmm. the room they send, the, they send originals to. So if you're, yes. you're an actual human being, not the doppelganger, they send you to the red room. Hence mm -hmm. the red eyes in one of the dolls. Mm -hmm. But if you are a bilocation, if you're a doppelganger, they send you to the green room mm. where you interact with other bilocations and they try mm -hmm. to advise you appropriately. So I just think that this, this, this double jointed doll with its implicit reference to Belmer, mm. it sets, it sort of intimates that the film deals with the inextricable conjoinment of mm -hmm. self and double that mm -hmm. the film explores in, in all mm -hmm. sorts of interesting ways. And now that I've been looking at that image for, <laughs> for a couple of minutes with the two, they're not quite identical. It, it occurred to me that you're setting up this difference between the red and the, the green and explaining what that, how that, what that means within the film's narrative. And it occurs to me that they have two different facial expressions where the, the red doll um, looks sort of angry and frustrated um, and miserable. And the, the green one just looks rather melancholy, which I think that plays out that way <laughs> uh, in know, the narrative. Absolutely. absolutely. And in, in so many doppelganger narratives, although the doppelganger is a physical repetition, mm. it, they are not necessarily emotional repetitions. Mm -hmm. they, in, in the case of bilocation, the bilocation feels everything that the self feels, but then in, it acquires new experiences that the self does not recognize. Mm -hmm. So it can, it can be a, the, the doppelganger or bilocation, it can end up becoming a sort of repetition with the difference. And I think, I think you're quite right that in the, in the, the way in which the dolls are depicted, it's, it's already suggesting that, that repetition with the difference. Did you talk about repetition with a difference in your book, in, the, in this book chapter? And I, I have a follow-up question, but maybe we'll get back to it because there's a lot of questions um, to cover, but I had, I had a question specifically about repetition with the difference. Um, I want, I want to get to sort of the heart of the question that I'm most interested in with regards to my own research, of course. Um, and that is that by location is by a woman director and we do not have very um, many of them. So I don't want to essentialize her position uh, necessarily, but I am wondering what does, um, what does this fact that we have this woman director and we have an original uh, novel that's also by a woman, what does that bring to the genre that we might not have seen before? I would say a few things. Um, <laughs> uh, certainly, Asato's direction foregrounds the gender concerns of the film in a way that perhaps a male director might not have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the issues that are foregrounded, uh, the films, the issues that are raised by the film, I, I think if we you know, take a step back and just think of um, uh, contemporary Japanese society, those issues resonate with the growing demographic of Japanese women who are either mm -hmm. postponing or foregoing marriage altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many, there's a, an increasing number of Japanese women who are opting instead for the, li for the life of a single woman, mm -hmm. to live as a single person with a career uh, and, the, and the free time to pursue uh, individual interests of one sort or another and escape, uh, escape the life of domestic drudgery that's mm -hmm. often associated with marriage. And, and certainly, um, 
with such significant shifts in attitudes, it's, it's really not surprising that marriage in Japan has, has hit the lowest level, I, I believe, since the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, as you point out, since the film itself is based on a novel by a woman, mm -hmm. it's hard to say how much credit goes to Asato and mm -hmm. how much credit goes to Hojo Haruka. Mm -hmm. I said those, those, a lot of those issues are in her novel as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but certainly what I would say regarding Asato is that the shot selection and editing help focus our attention on the problem of heteronormativity. Heter heteronormativity, I think, runs uh, throughout the film mm -hmm. uh, as an issue, especially in relation to the character of Shinobu and, and her bilocation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, it, and of course, it, it continues right up until the end uh, w when we learn that Shinobu... Here's a scene in which the, the doppelganger meets with uh, the original and off, the doppelganger is offering her wedding ring to mm. the original Shinobu, Kirimura mm -hmm. Shinobu. And Shinobu, you know, the original Shinobu has no plans mm -hmm. to give up her dreams of being a professional artist, nor should she. Mm -hmm. She has no interest in becoming a housewife to Masaru, no matter how sweet a guy he is. <laughs> he has no interest in that, and mm -hmm. she has no need for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the bilocation talks her into at least giving it some thought. And so shots like this, where we see this, this you know, close-up of mm -hmm. the, the ring being offered by the bilocation, hoping mm -hmm. that the original Shinobu will take her place. Mm -hmm. As as the the wife of Masaru, it's it it really foregrounds the the issue of heteronormativity in a in mm -hmm. a major way, and that that has to you know that that's Asato calling the shots in terms of shot selection and and, and editing. But you know in terms of how much it, it's always difficult because film is such a collaborative art. Uh, it, it's it's always a challenge to figure out how much credit to attribute to each mm. element of that collaboration. It, was it Asato who is determining the precise shot that's used in that scene, or was it something suggested by her cinematographer? You know, there, of course, there's a professional film editor involved as well, but it's very collaborative. So we tend to enthrone the director in a sort of auteurist way, when we should probably <laughs> yeah. be more of a collaborative effort. That's very true. And these, these are threads that exist. It's a little bit weird to say this, but when I was watching the film, I, I really had this sense that I was listening to a new or a fresh voice, I guess I should say. So there, there is just something there. And I was listening to a talk by Laura Mulvey earlier this um, year for her, for her new book, After Images. And somebody was asking her about gender and the gaze, because you're always going to ask Laura Mulvey about the gaze. Um, and she just basically came back to it and said, I, I got to a point where I was pretty sick of film, actually. But then women started making more films and there's just something different there. So she wasn't essentializing it either, but just when there's a non-normative voice or thread, even if, if it begins with a novelist, for example, it, it just feels different in some way. And so um, watching this film for me, I, I felt that resonate deeply within me from like a spectator position um, and not just the ending, which I actually am of two minds about. I have sort of a bilocation response to the ending. Um, There's an alternate ending. There is an alternate ending. I don't know if you're, if you're aware of I that. don't know that. It's, what it's, is it? <laughs> it was re-released two weeks after the original film as bilocation, bilocation Ura. By location behind like, it yeah, yeah. yeah and in the in the alternate version she no books she commits suicide but at the very end the by location does not dematerialize and and it goes on further it, it skips ahead there's a flash forward and nine months later she's pregnant oh so, <laughs> not the, it's not the ending that i prefer it's sort of it's sort of um it recapitulates the heteronormativity that the film has problematized up to that point. And I'm not really, I'm not really sure why Ma Asato felt compelled. I don't know if she, I don't know if it was her decision or if it was the studio's decision, because it is a Kadokawa film. Right. 
that I was not able to, I was, I was not able to sort of unpack the decision making behind re-releasing it in a second version with this alternate ending in which the bilocation survives mm-hmm. and, and gets, and has a, a, a continues on. Has an, a duplicate. As a du- yeah. <laughs> in her own way. That's interesting. I had no idea that that was the case. Um, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that ending either. Um, but it is interesting to, to know whether or not there was feedback about resistance to the sort of like anti-melodrama perhaps ending that happens um, it, and whether she got some sort of feedback that, you know, audiences are going to like it better if you give them a happy ending perhaps. I was also wondering if I watched it or when I watched it, there's an awful lot of explication in the film, sort of ex- explaining exactly what's happening so that there's like no confusion about what could be potentially very confusing plot twists. And I also wondered if that was some um, studio pressure to, to, you know, like this is too confusing. Down a little bit, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. But to get back to the ending, of course, this we have this resistance to head and normativity where, you know, she says, why, why would I ever be with someone I'd never even met before, right? And, you know, she wants to be this artist. So part of me was like, oh, I'm so team Kitty, Kitty Muda right now. Like that's, you know, be true to your own, own self. Um, but I also felt this tremendous sadness at the end because in some way it feels like society and certainly I think contemporary Japanese society pushes women into this choice. You can either be like the Shufu Okasan or you can be a career woman and you can't have both. And so almost in, in Takamura's case, it, it was like, a you can have it all. <laughs> and so, so part of me was also team Takamura for the same reason is that yes, it's heteronormative, but it's also allowing women finally to just say, I can be successful and also happy with a very nice relationship. Um, so I, I feel I feel two ways about it. I understand your your um, the difficulty in choosing which side to be on. I think the the complexity of those choices are. I think that's what uh, Asato presents so wonderfully. That yes. We feel the dilemmas that that both uh, Shino, Kirimura Shinobu and her doppelganger Takamura Shinobu are feeling. They're both caught. I mean, and because. Although uh, Takamoto Shinobu may seem like she has it all, mm. nevertheless, she is a, she realizes that she comes to the realization that she's a, she's a bilocation and she's living someone else's life. And so she offers to give up her own life. So she has her own dilemma. Yeah. And, and so sort of, they're sort of caught, they're caught in, they're caught in between. They're, they're sort of, they're both sort of caught in this, this uh-huh. double bind. And, and there's no, there doesn't seem to be a, well, there's, the way the original version of the film ends, it, it end, of course ends tragically. So there is no easy solution, even if the bilocation at one point seems to suggest a, a good solution. But now that you say that, I think what's so refreshing, even though there's tragedy, what's so refreshing is that there's a choice and they both get to make the choice that feels true to them ultimately, actually. Um, and often in horror films, it's women who don't have a choice <laughs> to do anything. So, um, oh, I, I, like, I feel at peace now that we, we have a happy ending of sorts, even though it's not coded as such. Um, so I, I wanna get to the issue of sound because of course sound is a major theme of the book that you've written. Um, and previously you've given this wonderful analysis of, of sound in the films of Kurosawa Kiyoshi, which I encourage everyone to, to read. Um, and having read that chapter before this one, now my ears were open to the role of sound in this film. So I was a little bit attuned to it. Um, and the film starts out with some sound cues, not just the idea that we're in a different language and maybe we're positioning the visual over sound in this case. Um, but later that opening scene, which you, uh, showed a, a still from earlier um, in the slide, which is that there's a lot of sound cues. So there's the scratching on the, of the charcoal on the, um, on the uh, canvas. <laughs> and then there's the scratching of the hair, which feels very similar. And then there's the doorbell. So there's these sort of cause and effect linked mirroring um, sounds. So I'm, I'm curious about sound motifs in this film. I think really important details of the film sound design. Um, they're subtle. Uh, mm-hmm extremely uh, important to the sound image relations of the film, um, particularly the, the doorbell, uh, which almost comes, it's, you know, it's a very short little motif. Mm. It's 
what is it? Ding, 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 dong, mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it's musical, and it comes mm-hmm. to function as a sort of light motif. And I would argue that it really functions as a light motif for Masaru. Uh. And if one takes seriously, if you take a step back and think about the way in which light motifs function within cinema, musical light motifs. Um, there are often territorial dimensions to light motifs. This is something I, I, I discuss um, elsewhere in my book. Yes. Uh, and there are often uh, territorial connotations that come into play when light motifs are, are used. At its most basic level, a light motif serves as a sort of signpost for a particular mm-hmm. character. It often serves as a signpost for a character, which announces that the character is present or signals the formation of, or assertion of the character. But one of the things that I found very interesting in um, writing about leitmotifs and thinking about how leitmotifs function in J-horror is, and this is something I discuss later in the the chapter when I talk about leitmotifs in relation to Miike Takashi's short film, Box, which Mm -hmm. is a film about joined twins, Mm -hmm. uh, is that leitmotifs can be used to indicate not only that a character has entered or is trying to enter a particular territory, But in some cases also that a character is attempting to take control over a particular territory. Now in a film like Jaws, that the the shark light motif is much more blatant. (laughs) Mm -hmm. More obvious that it's when we hear the 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 sound of the shark light motif, that dun 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 dun. That even Mm -hmm. if we don't see the shark, we know that the shark is present and Mm -hmm. about to be territorialized a particular space. Mm-hmm. I think that e- even a, a light motif as subtle and minimalist as the doorbell light motif in biolocation mm. may be serving a similar function. That is, um, it we hear it repeatedly mm-hmm. during the film, and if you think about it in, in, in terms of it, its territorial dimension, then maybe we it suggests something about the micropolitics of of this of those scenes in which. Mm. Saru keeps showing up and, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's in, insistently uh, ringing, ringing the doorbell. Mm-hmm. And in that context, in that sense, the original Shinobu's refusal to answer the door, since, of course, in the film, it's her bilocation that appears and, mm-hmm. and, and meets Masaru, and then everything unfolds from there. But the original Shinobu, the artist, she hears the doorbell repeatedly and she refuses to answer it. It's mm-hmm. interrupting her, her art, her artwork. It's interrupting mm-hmm. her process, and so, in a subtle sort of way, if we think of the light motif as being associated with Masaru, and we, if we think of some of the territorial dimensions of light of light motifs, it might be her refusal to answer the doorbell becomes a, a, a sort of act of resistance, whether wittingly or unwittingly, mm. to Masaru's uh, advances. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I find even more interesting about Asato's, uh, uh, what I find even more interesting um, in the film, besides the, the Asato's use of light motifs, mm. is her decision decision to selectively use silence in three mm-hmm. scenes and a very particular type of silence, absolute silence. And here mm-hmm. in this slide, I just thought it would be helpful for your students to break down the mm-hmm. types of violence in cinema. And this is a, this is a subject that um, a, a film sound scholar, Paul Faberge, has mm-hmm. worked on extensively. And he, he, he's come up with a very helpful differentiation of the four principal types of silence in sound cinema. And he breaks it down as follows. The first type is diegetic silence, in which selected diegetic parts of the soundtrack are silenced. In some cases, the silence might be filled by music or non-diegetic sounds. Second, uh, so for example, if you see a, a, a in in the in the in a particular scene, hmm. we see a train rushing past, but we don't hear the sound of the train, mm-hmm. the diegetic sound that we would associate with that with a train rushing past, that would be diege- that would be a form of diegetic silence. Hmm. Uh, dialogue silence is another type in which dialogue is suppressed where one would otherwise expect to hear it, uh, mm-hmm. while sounds and perhaps or non-diegetic music continues to be heard. So if we if we have a two shot of of, of characters who are having a, an exchange with one another, 
Mm-hmm. But we can't hear a word that's coming out of their mouths. Uh, and all we hear are, are, is either music, perhaps non-diegetic music or other ambient sounds. That would be a form of dialogue, dialogue silence. Musical silence is a type of silence in which music is suppressed where one would otherwise expect to hear it. Say, for example, in a, in a, in a scene where uh, we see a musician performing or a band, some, some, someone's performing music on screen, but we can't, we can't hear it. Uh, mm-hmm. it's not the soundtrack, or we hear, uh, we see, or we see a character listening um, to a, a digital music player, listening to a song on their on their cell phone, or listening to the radio or a phonograph, but we cannot hear the music that's being played. That would be musical silence. Mm-hmm. But the last form of silence is really the most uncommon form of silence of all mm-hmm. sound cinema, mm-hmm. and that's absolute silence. The total suspension of sound. We don't hear ambient or environmental sounds. We don't, so there's no, it's total diegetic silence. We don't hear any dialogue. We don't hear music. We mm-hmm. don't hear anything. Just complete silence. And there are three scenes in which Asato hmm. makes use of absolute silence. Very, it starts, it's very subtle. It starts off very subtly and then it becomes more pronounced. Mm-hmm. The first scene uh, that I, I noticed it was um, when the bilocation Shinobu that is, Takamoto Shinobu goes to the dry cleaner to pick up her clothes. It's a very mm-hmm. mundane scene. And in this scene, due to the force of habit, she initially writes down her maiden name, Kirimura. She's asked, uh, the person who's the manager of the dry cleaner asks her to you know, write down your name so I can go get your stuff. And mm-hmm. She writes down Kirimura, her, her maiden name, by mistake, and then she crosses it out. Of course, that, cro- that placing under erasure has its own significance, but she crosses it out and she replaces it with her married name, Takamura. Mm-hmm. We hear sound, we hear the sounds of her, her scratching, we hear, hear her writing sounds at that point. And then at that moment, when she, as soon as she does that, we, it cuts to this close up of this mm. woman running the dry cleaner who looks mm-hmm. straight into the camera. This is obviously um, uh, Takamura Shinobu's POV. Mm-hmm. And the sound drops out completely, mm-hmm. including all the ambient ambient background noise that's associated with the dry cleaner. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we skip ahead and you wonder, it's, it's, at that point you're wondering, well, oh, what just happened there? Yeah. It's sort of, it's, sort of, it's, a, it's not jarring per se, but it, it sort of gets your attention, but it's very subtle and it's very brief. Mm-hmm. And then not long after that, um, there's a scene that occurs when the original Shinobu is somewhat involuntarily <laughs> introduced <to> this <laughs> victim support group by this detective Kano. Mm-hmm. As the original Shinobu was walking past the large mirror mm-hmm. that serves as a sort of test for, for all who enter, mm-hmm. she gazes at her reflection. And at that moment, absolute silence is used yet again to underscore the moment. All sound drops out of the soundtrack. But the mm-hmm. most the most uh, pronounced use of absolute silence uh, occurs close to the climax of the film. Mm-hmm. After the bilocation, Shinobu, uh, she received, there's this uh, scene where she receives flowers from Masaru for winning the art competition. It's, mm-hmm. There's a certain irony that your bi- the bilocation is a better artist than the, yes. the original self. And so she wins this art competition, Masaru presents her with flowers, he reaffirms that now they can finally live like a proper married couple with all the there are no mm-hmm. connotations that are clearly implied. Mm-hmm. Then it cuts to the original Shinobu sitting alone in her studio. Mm-hmm. And I, I just wanted to show you this clip and then and then act a little bit in terms of its its use of silence. Jesho, やっと夫婦らしい生活ができるな。今までごめんな。私こそ。<音楽> 
しのぶはこれっていうだな。I find this scene so powerful in large part because of its use of, of absolute silence, because of its sound design.、Mm-hmm. As Shinobu looks around her studio with its empty painter's easel and, and、uh, the tears start to run down her cheeks,、mm. she's contemplating her own end.、Mm. And yet, at this particular, in, in, during this sequence, there are,、uh, we, there are over 60 seconds of absolute silence that are inserted、uh, and、mm-hmm. that really underscore the poignancy of that moment until,、mm-hmm. until it's interrupted in the, next, in the next sequence by this abrupt cut to Masaru telling the bilocation Shinobu about a wedding, this wonderful wedding dress、mm-hmm. that he's quite like. And, she, and it's, it's such a rude awakening.、Mm-hmm. Uh, because in that moment of silence, when we're sitting in the room, effectively, we are, as, as, the, as the audience, we're in the room alone with the original Shinobu, and we're feeling、mm-hmm. what she's feeling in her silence.、Mm-hmm. Um, and in all three, all three scenes that I mentioned, I think absolute silence is employed as a subtle but very effective way. To heighten our awareness that something significant is happening.、Mm. We don't always know what it is, but especially when you drop out all sound, including、mm. really noticeable when you drop out ambient sound as well,、mm-hmm. then it, sort of, it gets your attention. It's sort of the, the, the inverse of a stinger, of a jump scare. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of hitting you over the head and saying, you must be scared now, and it, it,、uh, mm. using a loud noise to make you jump out of your seat, it's the opposite.、Mm. So subtly, it pulls out all sound、mm-hmm. and yet forces us, it compels us to focus on what's happening in that particular scene.、Mm-hmm. I say,、um, although I don't, I don't really talk about this in, in my book, I don't. I don't talk about Asato's relationship to Kurosawa Kiyoshi.、Mm. It is significant that she, she was mentored by, by Kurosawa Kiyoshi,、mm-hmm. an apprentice of his. I think she, 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 was,、uh, she did some photography for him.、Mm-hmm. Uh, and especially in the case of, in the, in the case of、um, her, the sound design of Biolocation, but also、uh, in other ways, Asato's deft, very deft use of silence. Reminds me a great deal of, of how Kurosawa Kiyoshi has、yeah. used violence in some of his films,、uh, films like Cure, Archive,、mm-hmm. Seance. And I, I wonder you know, to what extent she, she has, she has、um, figured out that silence can be a very powerful tool. Yeah. She's, used, she's opted to use that in her own films. But I, I think the way she, she employs silence is incredibly. Uh, subtle and, and really effective, very moving. I feel the most moved I th- before we started the conversation. We were both <laughs> sharing, sharing our responses to the film and how it makes one weep. And I, every time I show this film, I've shown it multiple times now, but I have to sort of gather myself after I've watched the film, if I'm showing it to a class, because the tears are running down my, my face by the end. And it's, I think part of it is the sound design. The sound、yeah. design, moments like that make it even more powerful than if, if, you know, she,、uh, if Asato had instead used a really sappy musical cue. Silence can be even more powerful than a musical cue in that instance. Yeah, it, it, it creates a void that I think. Rather than creating a distance, it helps us, you know, it compels us to fill. You know, it, it compels us to fill with our, our, own,、um, our own emotions. And it, yes, I cried when I watched this film. I was, it was a good thing you were screen sharing and I was gone because I was starting to tear up a little bit. Just listening to you, it also speaks so poetically about the film as well、um, in that scene.、Uh, where was I going with that? <laughs> Now I'm sort of feeling very clumped again.、Um, It's, it's unusual for a film to make me cry, I would say, at this point.、Um, you know, after、uh, years of being a hardened sort of film、um, critical analysis as part of our trade, that I'm sort of、uh, 
muted, I guess, I suppose, to a lot of the, the emotions that a film is trying to make me feel. So it was surprising me not only to cry during a horror film, but to cry at all. Um, I think I once introduced Okuribiko Departures to students as a comedy because I completely forgot. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very sad film. And when I rose the house light, I just had these watery faces looking at me like, Sensei, why did you do that to us? Why did you trick us? I don't know. It was funny. <laughs> If you're crying with laughter, or, or yeah, right, that was a that was a gas, wasn't it? Um, yeah, so there there is something absolutely profound, and in my grad sem that I just taught, we focused on the first chapter of your book where we did watch Cairo by by Kurosawa, and we were discussing the effectiveness of absolute silence in that film as well, and all the grad students agreed that yes what makes it so scary is that it's silent it would not in fact be scary um because it's a very low budget <laughs> film as is right uh but but they all, it, it they, all they all are this one actually i thought had a, a pretty good it probably budget. has more of a budget but... so i have i think um maybe one or two more questions for you if you have time you're all right okay um, so let's talk a little bit about mirrors and, and mirroring. And you do talk about this quite a bit in your book. Um, I think that mirroring in this film is unusual. Um, and that's because, as I alluded to earlier in our conversation, I think the um, priority placed on visuals over sound actually tricks the audience into um, relying on the camera to tell them what's actually happening. Whereas if we go back to um, that scene that you were talking about uh, with the doorbell where she drops the package and it lands in the pool of water and she actually sees a reflection from the very beginning. So it, it, it makes you think, oh, this is the real um, person that we're going to follow throughout the film when in fact, no, that is the Mise Mono, that is the fake by location. Um, and you can't trust um, because you're in her perspective. So she sees her reflection, but we're so used to the camera being this, this external thing. So um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about this juxtaposition of sound and visuals and tricking the audience and perspective? Who are we to believe? You know, what's, I think you're quite right that it, 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 the, the viewer is led to believe that it, it, we're given a false sense of, of security that we can trust the visuals when we really can't. Mm. Um, and it's not always clear as from the editing of the film, it's not always clear to the viewer when shifts are taking place from subjective to objective camera and back again. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I think is certainly, it may be frustrating to, to some viewers who <laughs> might be misled. I think the editing of the film is such that they, as you mentioned the, um, the, the, sh the shots involving the puddle. Mm -hmm. And of course the whole logic of the, the whole logic of the film, which we should explain is that if you're not a bilocation, if you're if you're just you know if you're a human being, a bona fide human being who's really existing, then when you look in the mirror, you see your reflection. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the same room with uh, your bilocation or someone else's bilocation, if you look into a mirror at them, they have no reflection. Mm -hmm. And so the, the device of the mirror comes to play an important role throughout the film. And they, at one point, the bilocation support group hands out these little pocket, pocket mirrors mm -hmm. so that you can check to see if, if the, uh, the other person, another person from the bilocation support group that you're interacting with is really a human being, an original or a, a bilocation. But it comes to be untrustworthy because if you're a bilocation, when you look into the mirror, you see you see your reflection, mm -hmm. and, and so there are these scenes. You know, for, so for example, the, the scene that you reference um, uh, near the beginning of the film, after, you know, after the prologue, when Masato uh, rings the doorbell, and it's, and actually we think it's the original Shinobu who, who mm. answers the door, but it, it's her bilocation who answers the door, and when she meets him for the first time, they have this exchange, and we get a a shot, we see a shot, an overhead shot of the puddle, and we see both of their reflections. We mm. see Masato's reflection, we see Shinobu's reflection. So initially one might think, well, that must be the original Shinobu. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, what we're not, what's not obvious from it is that that's actually a subjective camera. Mm -hmm. that's, 
that's, uh, that, that reflection is the reflection uh, from the perspective of the bilocation. Yes. And, and so that, that whole logic of, you know, we're sort of led to believe that we can trust this, this logic of reflections, but then it's deconstructed because the bilocation also sees a reflection when they look mm -hmm. in the mirror. And really, uh, this, I think this, this duplicity, this visual duplicity, if you will, is an essential part of bilocation's sound image relations. And in some cases, um, it, the way out of it is through voiceover narration or other sound cues. But there's also, you know, there's also an, one other significant guide that, the guide that is there to help us navigate the film's many puzzles. Mm -hmm. And that's the character of Kagami. Mm -hmm. and of course, Kagami, whose name is a homophone for mirror and, and mm -hmm. model, depending on the, mm -hmm. on the kanji that's used, plays an important role within the film and functions as a mirror of a different sort. Mm -hmm. It helps, helps the audience uh, further differentiate copy from model, and by location from original. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of the film, when one of the characters recites the members' names, they're told when you, whenever there's an interaction with members of the by location support group that you have to recite all the names of the, all the members of the group. Mm -hmm. And if that group includes Kagami, then you're clearly a by location. Mm -hmm. That is, the people who are running the group know you're a by location. Whereas mm -hmm. if the recitation of the names of the, of, the, of the members of the group does not include Kagami, mm -hmm. then they know that you're a real human being and mm -hmm. not, a, not, a, not a fake or a by location or a doppelganger. So mm -hmm. Kagami, in addition to the sound image relations of the film, which are, are slippery mm -hmm. uh, route, Kagami is the one sort of way in which is the one standard that it's, it, that's used to help us differentiate who is, who is uh, real from who is a doppelganger. Mm -hmm. So Kagami, as a character, Kagami, whose name is a homophone for mirror, functions mm -hmm. as another kind of mirror. Mm -hmm. Thinking about Kagami, you know, this he's the mirror, that's the that's the one that's gonna signal it. And he's also, I think, the most mysterious figure because he's the oldest member of the group, but we don't really know why he's there except for some philosophical idea he has about your other beings being just as legitimate as you, or maybe even more ideal than you. Uh, but he's also clearly a teenager, so <laughs> if he's the oldest, did he join when he was six, you know? <laughs> He's very, he's very precocious. He's wearing a mask. Yes, yes. Bill, I don't know why, why he does. I don't know what, what that, what the purpose of that is, but he, and he reveals he, he has the scar too, and then it is. Did you? That, we don't know what, what that's from, or he doesn't have a bilocation, but he's sort of a, he is a, he's a cipher. Yes. But he, he's also kind of a litmus test. He, he is a, he's a device to help us differentiate uh, original self from double. I'm intrigued by the male characters too, because we get these very fleshed out female characters and then we sort of have these male characters who really aren't three dimensional at all. So maybe that's also a, a divergence from the, from the genre that we're getting. Um, so you, you've laid out um, that there are these, this red room and the, and the green room. And when um, the protagonist finally confronts herself in the red room, um, the costume here, here is distinct. So we have one in black and the other in, in white and they're both dressed in suits. So is there anything underlying this um, color palette choice we have here? Yeah, it's very, it's, it's certainly a, a, an overt. Um, yes. <laughs> and mm -hmm. if this were a traditional doppelganger film where the doppelganger is always set up as the bad guy, mm -hmm. and, and, and certainly there are bilocations who are malevolent in, by, yes. in this film, but not all bilocations are malevolent within the film. Mm -hmm. That's one of the interesting things about the film is that we, it, we encounter some bilocations, such as um, the bilocation of Shinobu, who's clearly not malevolent in any way. Um, mm -hmm. And one could argue even the bilocation of Mayumi, mm -hmm. the, the, mother of, the, the, the mother whose young son is in the hospital, uh, there's this whole, uh, you know, sequence involving uh, the bilocation Mayumi, whom we think is trying to kidnap the the son of the the yes. biological Mayumi, but she's actually trying to protect him. Yes. The bilocation is trying to protect the son of Mayumi from mm -hmm. harm, 
uh, that, that's being inflicted upon him by his biological mother. So it's very interesting in the way in which it, the film uh, presents some bilocations or doppelgangers that are malevolent, which is very commonplace in, in most doppelganger narratives, but mm -hmm. it departs from that, those usual expectations by presenting us with doppelgangers who are not the evil id, you know, the mm -hmm. evil alter ego uh, of, the, of the self. Mm -hmm. And so this use of the, the black and white, the, the, the costuming, the costume color coding here, if this were a traditional Hollywood doppelganger film, mm -hmm. that I would say, you know, the, the, the hero is the one wearing white and the villain is the one wearing black. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if the color choices here don't hit, hint at something more complex, mm -hmm. dynamics between the original Shinobu and her bilocation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, when I see, when I see, when I think about the color coding of the of the scene, I wonder if it's coming, if it's trying to suggest something more akin to sort of yin yang, mm. yin -yang intertwinement of contrary forces, mm -hmm. sort of a bifurcation of of good and good and evil. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, but that I was curious what you what your take was on. I like that yin. I like that yin yang thing because also, um, what is her name? A Takamura, who's on the on the left side when she's wearing the black suit, she still has a white blouse, and Kirimura has a black purse. So there's sort of like that little element of the other one. So I like. I'm I'm rather fond of what you just said. Um, but I was also, and this was just inspired by the the screen grabs that you've provided today, um, which is. There's this scene, then they go back um, to the apartment, and then there's that tragic scene that we end on. And of course, you have Kiriyama in this white dress, which to me in horror films signifies death, right? So there's this <laughs> foreshadowing that um, it's not going to go very well for her, I think. But you have her in her apartment, and then you have that wedding dress, um, right? And so I, it only just occurred to me seeing it again now that not only is it maybe foreshadowing her death, but also this subversion of heteronormativity where marriage and is also a kind of mini death. Um, yeah. Maybe, yeah. That's very interesting because it is, the editing is so deliberate. Yeah. After she, after Shinobu makes this decision to end her life, it cuts abruptly to this close up of this, <laughs> this wedding dress in this, in this glamorous layout with yes. Masaru saying, Oh, wouldn't this be great? You know, so <laughs> I, I think that's there, there may be this sort of yeah. implied coding or I, and these layers of subversion they're so interesting you, you've switched who's the good guy who's the good, good guy bad guy right um switching that and I'm glad you brought up the mother with her son too because there's a subversion of normativity in that where her her breaking point is I can't take my son I can't take being in this hospital anymore and she tries to kill well she almost tries to kill her son and then she restrains herself um but that subverts the idea of the nurturing mother as well right so there's oh a lot happening <laughs> um so uh, my my last big question for you um we know in horror films that they're drawing on different layers of, of textuality um, and subtext as we, we just are talking about the complication of, of meaning and even that imagery. Um, so we have the surface level text and then we have underlying moral panic or social fears and anxieties. Um, and here we have the duplication of oneself in society as a nightmare. Are there other underlying um, anxiety or moral panic that you find in this film that's probably against the grain simmering you know, I, it's really interesting. As it's, a, it's, it's always a very interesting question to ask about any day horror film, since there are always social subtexts, mm -hmm. you know, some, some form or another. Uh, J horror. I think one of the things that uh, has always intrigued me about J horror is that it, it's almost it, it very often could be uh, viewed or analyzed as a form of social horror. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I find very interesting about bilocation, one of the choices I found interesting. Uh, uh, was that Asato chose not to uh, to use social media in the film? If social media is all, is largely uh, absent in the film, uh -huh. um, but surveillance cameras, for example, do play a role uh, in in some sequences, uh, showing us the the capturing the sort of surveilled capturing of the movement and behavior of 
mm -hmm. originals and their bilocations. Mm -hmm. I certainly given the when the film was released, even mm -hmm. if social media don't play a, a role in the film, they're largely mm -hmm. absent. I just, you know, I, I can't help but suspect that it, for viewers watching this film in the age of Facebook and Instagram and mm -hmm. Twitter and YouTube, mm -hmm. are, as we all have digital doppelgangers that are starting mm -hmm. to live across the internet, internet. and mm -hmm. even more so in the age of the pandemic, when mm -hmm. so, so much of us are teaching or, and or learning <laughs> and Zoom, and these interactions are being recorded for posterity and they end up in the cloud somewhere. Um, I do wonder, you know, to what extent, you know, if a film like this resonates with the contemporary audience, especially because we are so accustomed to having digital doppelgangers of our own. Mm -hmm. uh, and as our digital doppelgangers proliferate, so too do problems such as identity theft. Identity theft has mm -hmm. become more and more commonplace. Um, and in a sense, the problem of the doppelganger is increasingly becoming everyone's problem. Mm -hmm. It's not just mm -hmm. a problem that you associate with a doppelganger narrative, whether it's a, a, a tale by Edgar Allan Poe or, or, or someone else, or, Haj, or Hojo Haruka, uh, or something you watch in the movie theater, and then as soon as you exit the movie theater, you can forget about it. Mm -hmm. We all have that digital doppelgangers mm -hmm. in this day and age for better or worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even social media are largely absent from the film. That's one way in which I, I imagine the film may resonate with mm -hmm. audiences uh, because it suggests that doppelgangers perhaps are not so far-fetched after all. I'm so glad that you said that because I, it didn't even occur to me as I was, what maybe because it feels dated and they're still using flip um, clamshell phones. But even before this film, you had had J horror films that were very concerned about the internet, of course, right? And um, social media and being connected in this film is really very disconnected. Um, and now my mind is sort of spinning a bit. You're right, if it were made under sort of normal, um, more sort of realistic circumstances, the first thing the character would do is go and Google by location, right? And try and do some internet research about it. Um, and there's no text messaging in this either. So, um, or at least not that I can recall it also. Oh, that's really, really interesting. It reminds me of what you talk about in your very chapter of one of Deleuze's aspects of the frame is that which is not in the frame is just as important as what is in the frame. And yes, the the world the, the world of the social uh, technology is not is not here. Well, Stephen, I have one one off quick question for you yeah. because you mentioned that you're teaching a class on on doppelgangers this coming term, um, and I'm wondering if you could just recommend some more films about double. You talk about box and you talk about doppelganger and you talk about by location in this chapter. Do you have other recommendations for people? Absolutely. Too many, too many. Um, <laughs> too many. I, I've, I've compiled such a long filmography of doppelganger films. It's amazing, that, but I'll just mention a few. Um, Enemy by Denis mm -hmm. Villeneuve, I think is really outstanding. Um, it's, uh, it's very, it's a subtle, low budget sort of interrogations uh, of the doppelganger with Jake Gyllenhaal, mm -hmm. a history professor who discovers he has a doppelganger, lives, also lives in, I think they reside, he resides in Toronto, he discovers he has a doppelganger <laughs> who's, a, who's an actor, uh, and it's, it's really brilliantly done. Um, going back, Further, uh, films such as um, The Dark Half mm -hmm. by George Romero, that's a Stephen King adaptation. I, I think, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think that um, By Location actually may have been inspired by The Dark Half. I don't talk about it in my chapter, but teaching The Dark Half, it seems very obvious to me that, there, that Asato was thinking about The Dark Half uh, when, she, when she made um, By Location, although By Location is its own unique um, mm -hmm. Art. Uh, other films, of course, The Black Swan, which is a, an interesting sort of, it's sort of a split subjectivity mm -hmm. narrative, if you will. Uh, but that also split subjectivity narratives also, I think, uh, may be situated along the continuum of doubling to which uh, doppel doppelganger narratives belong. Mm 
Dead Ringers, that's a David Cronenberg mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. with twins, not conjoined twins. Uh, twin twin gynecologists. <laughs> I've never yes. heard of it. bizarre. It's a bizarre setup, but it's actually a very compelling film about doubling mm -hmm. and, uh, and the fear of being displaced by your by your twin in this case. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, uh, a more recent film would be um, The Double uh, with Jesse Eisenberg, uh, which is um, mm -hmm. a, a film directed by Richard Ayoade. Uh, and is an, is an, it's a sort of a loose adaptation of Dostoevsky's novella, The mm. Double, which is absolutely, mm. oh, when I teach my doppelganger uh, seminar, although it's, we're focused almost exclusively on film, I do assign some examples of doppelganger literature. And I, I mm. have them read Dostoevsky's novella because it's so brilliant. Okay. And it, it just... <laughs> It anticipates almost every possible doppelganger move you know, with a <laughs> doppelganger narrative. Um, it's all there. I also I, I also like to assign um, Edgar Allan Poe's William Wilson. Oh, a brilliant Poe short story that deals with the doppelganger and is you know just incredibly insightful. So I have them watching films, uh, watch doppelganger films, but then we also look at what what writers have done with the doppelganger as a motif. So those are a few. I can send you, I can send you a lengthy, a lengthy filmography. Can I have a, a Zoom room invite so I could just take the class? <laughs> would be wonderful. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining me, with, joining me today. It was a real delight to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me, Kelly. It's great to be here with you, even if, if only virtually.